Warning, this episode contains spoilers for all published books in the Song of Ice and Fire series, as well as all aired episodes of Game of Thrones. They say he burns his enemies alive to honor the Lord of Light. Why are all the gods such vicious cunts? Where is the god of tits and wine? Knowledge is power. Power, power. I am Daenerys Stormborn of the blood of old Valyria, and I will take what is mine. With fire and blood, I will take it. Honey, I'm back home, attacking all. Should've never left your crap alone, cause I'm known to run a bit snatch at all. Especially rap crowds, cause I'm at the thrones. Like Baratheon, Stannis, Baratheon, Stannis, Stannis. But you won't defeat me, I'm better. Send him back to life like I'm Jon Snow. Stab wounds, he just wipes off him. The wildlings in no fight for him. Three dragons, they can't ignite on him. Welcome to another episode of The Vassals of Kingsgrave. I'm your host, Kevin, also known as Gaiden on the Forums. Joining me for this discussion today is Matt. Hey, Blue Armor on the Forums. Michael. Hey, Kawadegi on the Forums. And Donna. And Donna. <laughs> Team Donna on the Forums, who can't use their mutant but buttons properly, <laughs> because buttons confuse me. Coming hot. So it's Black History Month, so for this episode we will be discussing the Summer Isles and all of the characters that originate from there. We will also be discussing diversity in the book series as well as on the show. Is this series diverse? Should there be more representation? And how does Martin handle writing characters of color? To start the conversation off, let's talk about the Summer Isles themselves. It is an archipelago located probably somewhere around the equator. Martin has never made it quite clear what his world looks like. I guess it's for mystery and for realism since we only know as much as the characters do and most of them have not explored the outer limits of the actual world itself. The Summer Isles are the equivalent of Africa in this Ice and Fire series. It is mapped and we do get the name of each isle. There is Wolano, Umbaru, and the largest of the isles, which is Jala, and which contains the Red Flower Vale, where Jalabarzo is from. Before he was exiled, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later, the Giscari were the first outsiders to reach the islands. However, once they saw the black skinned inhabitants, they declared they were demons burned by hell and immediately fled. They called the lands the Demon Isles and never returned. After this, the islanders set off to explore the world. They started building their swan ships. We get some notable people like Mouth, Malthar the Windrider, aka Malthar the Mapmaker. They began trading with the Valerians before the Doom. First, they were precious resources, and then they began to trade in slaves as well. This brings us to the Years of Shame, the time period when the Islanders sold their owner to bondage. This all ended after the warrior princess Zonda Quo ended slavery and then went to war with any would-be slavers. There are some notable locations, such as Tall Trees Town, which contains the talking trees. They are trees that don't talk, but <laughs> they're the history of the Summer Islanders are carved into the trunks. There is also the singing stones. There's Koj, where Malthar Mapmaker first built or had the finest shipyards, um, as well as Umbolu. i terrible at pronouncing these names, but it is a desolate out northeast of Walanu. Um, yeah, that's as far as I want to go with describing the Summer Isles. Um, does anyone have anything interesting they want to talk about with regard to the Isles themselves? They sort of strike me as like a fusion between Africa and the Caribbean. Like there's, I think there's elephants in the summer islands. There's like lots of monkeys and other stuff, but yeah, not quite one or the other. Um, that, that was always the impression I got from them. Yeah, there's a brief mention of the flora and fauna in the very start of the chapter, but I don't recall elephants. Yeah, it was more, it was more like, uh, creatures you would find in, in jungles like because I, I just think that that's kind of the basic uh, biome of of the summer islands so it was more like panthers and um, parrots and other colored birds um, and I don't know there was some other stuff listed in there too monkeys plus uh, if uh, there were elephants that would have like island dwarfism and be like those elephants and Rhinos that they found on 
one of those Mediterranean islands. I want to say Cyprus, but I could be wrong. Like all those fossils. So they'd be like tiny, really adorable elephants and not rideable. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would say overall, like the, the setting is mostly, um, you know, like a jungle Caribbean island like style. Um, but they just take cultural aspects of of Africa to kind of build the um, the characters of the and the backgrounds of of this people. Yeah, one thing I noticed about their culture that sort of um, interests me was the fact that when they wage wars, it, there's, it's very um, organized, and their wars don't last for, but for more than a day. And the princes or the royalty, they don't get involved. They're they're never harmed but it's only just the warriors that fight and get killed. And there's no pillaging, there's no raping, there's no, like, incredible violence like in the Westerosi Wars, which makes it um, very interesting that Jala Barzo wants to bring over Westerosi knights and soldiers to fight in his town because, or to reclaim the Red Flower Veil, because if that happens, it's not going to be a war like any of the Summer Islanders are used to. I do wonder if uh, Jala Barzo... Um thinks he actually will uh, convince Robert and then later Cersei. And I do wonder if he's just like, this is my life now, being in exile in the Red Keep. And he, se he seems pretty content to chill, sort of like as a counterpoint to Viserys as an exile who is not content to chill. Um, yeah, that was, that was sort of the impression I got. Yeah, no, I, would, I would kind of agree with that, Michael. Yeah. Um... Yeah, no, those those battles are very interesting where they essentially, you know, to decide who's going to win the conflict. They just, you know, run like a day long training exercise just, you know, with uh, with killing. <laughs> it's basically like whoever comes out on top of the, the exercise then gets to be the, you know, the leader of the island. So uh, one aspect, uh, I remember when The World of Ice and Fire first came out and we were discussing the various various other cultures that had been introduced, uh, someone on the forums said the Summer Islands remind uh, make them think of white guilt <laughs> from George's part uh, because the Summer Islands come across as uh, they basically have no flaws, almost. I mean, they're still going to war, but it's this very ritualized, no rape, no pillage, and when you look at some of their other aspects of their society, they're sex positive. They uh, they allow women to rule. Um, they have the best ships, the best archers. Um, I don't know what I what I really if I ever decided if I had an opinion on that. What what do you guys think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, they're not really. Besides their archers, they're not really a warlike people. So, I mean, if if they ever, I mean. They created those archers in order to um, discourage other people from attacking them, um, but they they could never, you know, launch a full scale invasion or war against any other um, people just because they don't have the the tools and technology um, of ironworking to really avail themselves with. Um, I, yeah, I guess I mean, in pulling this out, they don't really have. Um, many flaws or whatever. I, I mean, I don't know. It's still, you know, they still quarrel between themselves. They just minimalize the, um, the violence, uh, most likely just because I, I doubt they're very, they don't seem like a very, really fairly populous, um, people. The impression I got was, um, when George sat down to write The World of Ice and Fire, or even before, he said, right, in this world, I'm gonna have one society that just works and, like, functions, and that way he's sort of avoiding the pitfalls of grimdark fantasy where everything is bad all the time. So, the Summer Islands is like this utopia, sort of silver lining in a, in a, in a really, really gray, black world. But yeah, I, I don't know how I feel the fact that it's it's a, a culture that has very little to do with the main plot, and then it also happens to be people of color. I'm not quite sure. I I didn't feel white guilt when I read the uh, read of the Summer Islanders. Um, I did see some comparisons to our real world history with the years of shame and how the Summer Islanders sold their own into slavery. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. No, I just thought it was something interesting. 
But it is a good point because I, I again I didn't notice like they were so so much of a, a quote unquote perfect people because I was in organizing this episode I noticed that there were very there were many characters from the Summer Isles who do appear in sort of villainous roles like some of the bloody mummers are from the Summer Isles. Right. I mean, well, yeah, it's like all the yeah, all the truly like warlike people who you know want to fight and kill people essentially leave the aisles um or they get um exiled or whatever because uh, i mean that's the one place we're going to see them where uh, i mean they won't have much bearing over all the main story but there is like a an archer squad amongst the golden company that's made up of 50 summer islanders um but beyond that and then the people of the sim and winds like they just they don't play a major role in the story yeah, and um, I, I will say that um, re- in reading it, and um, I was kind of happy that the Summer Islanders weren't involved in any of the um, fuckery that takes place across the world because I'm like, okay, good. The black people, they're on their island. They're chill. There's no winter is coming for them. There's no pale mare. There's no apocalypse bearing down on them. They're safe. And I, I mean, as a black reader, I was like, cool, that they're, they're at least safe. From the the horribleness that takes place in this world. <laughs> yeah. Besides that one time they ventured into like Sothorios. <laughs> and nothing good happens to anyone that goes to Sothorios. Right. Yeah. Realized they made a terrible mistake and never went back. <laughs> All right. I guess that can bring us to talking about some of the characters from the Summer Isle. You did mention the Black Archer Company that's going with um the Golden Company to invade Westeros, um, led by Black Balak. Uh, I mean, there's not much here to discuss of him. He's just the leader of these uh, elite archers. Uh, anyone have anything to say about that? No, we, I mean, yeah, we don't know much about him yet, but I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more. He seems a important figure in the Golden Company. I'm sure we'll learn more about kind of the, the main leaders of that group throughout uh, Aegon's storyline and wins and However long he lasts. It's interesting. I think that it's. He... Oh, no, go oh, ahead, I think it's interesting um, that it shows that other the Golden Company is no longer just exiles from Westeros. It's becoming a bit more diverse, um, and I think that might have an influence on what their ultimate motivations are. Yes. Well, speaking of diversity and uh, with the Golden Company, I've, I noticed that like in the later books that there are more characters of color factoring into the uh, the POV characters storylines. Like with, with uh, John Connington, we have Black Balak and uh, the various people of color within the Golden Company um, and Victorian storyline. And also Tyrion's, you have Makoro. And then Sam's storyline, we have Kojo Mo and her father, Kohoro Mo. And I wonder if that's because of Martin changing as a writer as time goes on. This, I guess those books are written more into the late 90s, early 2000s. I wouldn't be surprised if this was maybe either he realized this or he got a, some people said, hey, there's, there's very few characters of color. Can you try and rectify this? I know in other aspects of his writing, he's... It, it would seem that in Feast of Crows and the Dance of Dragons, he's tried to correct some of the world-building things he's not happy with in a very subtle manner. Yes. And I noticed in the earlier books, um, homosexuality was more alluded to than shown outright on the page. And in a Dance with Dragons, we have, I forget, I think his name is Bokoko, and he's known for having a male paramour. And there's frequent references to... Like, I hate saying the term, but butt boys and male prostitutes is it's frequently referenced more so than in the earlier novels. So, yeah, I wonder if he has some more of a uh, modern mindset. Yeah, I mean, it's it's also just kind of how it's lo- I mean, it's location and just how he set up the world where I mean, the and, and how he set the story where it's just because it's, you know, it's all focused on West Rose, which is all white people. Um, and that's going to be the, the center of the storyline. And so all the other, um, nations, um, that have more diverse, um, people are just, you know, they're periphery and only come into the story when they involve, um, the, 
the main Westerosi characters or people trying to get back to Westeros. Um, so yeah, so that's certainly part of it where, you know, the, the earlier novels were, were all set on the one continent and now that it's slowly expanding out, then we see, you know, the more diverse people. Um, but, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's, it's clear that he has tried to rectify some stuff and, um, bring in a more, um, accepting worldview, um, throughout the later books. Certainly a dance with dragons is very associate based. I think it might have more Essos chapters than Westeros chapters. I'd need to review that. Hmm. It could also be Martin having not only a more modern view, but a more ancient view um, with the Valyrians being pretty much the Roman em- empire. But you also have things like, um, like Octavian before he was Augustus, like he used um, Nubian cavalry and uh, those kind of units within his own army to defeat Mark Antony and Cleopatra from memory that could be completely wrong and I could be getting a few fights mixed up, a few battles mixed up, but it does show it's kind of flipped where after the Roman like empire falls, or like Valyria falls, you have more diversity coming into Essos, Essos with armies, that kind of thing, where it was actually before the Roman empire fell, you had more diversity within the armies and people moving um, over, there, there was no nations back then, but over multiple nations and countries to, to be in like far flung areas. Okay, but speaking of the Valerians, I do want to get back to talking about each individual character who is from the Summer Isles who plays a big part in the story. But I, I feel like, Donna, you gave us a good jumping off point to talk about, um, a post that Martin put on his not a blog about um i'm sorry but that was the most beautiful segue i have ever heard thank you that was so good (laughs) thank you um the best host um speak martin did a post on his not a blog saying that um maybe it would have been a good idea if the targaryens were black or the valerians were black um let me read it in its entirety so i don't get his words mixed up um this was uh in response to a casting decision uh when it came to the dornish when Oberyn Martell was introduced, as well as uh, Ilaria and the rest of the Dornish people, um, some people were not quite happy with Pedro Pascal's choice. Some people were, uh, and Martin had to kind of like clear the air. And that led to this post, which he says, um, speaking of Valyria, right from the start, I wanted the Targaryens and by extension, the Valerians from whom they were descended to be a race apart with distinctive features that set them apart from the West of Re- from the rest of Westeros and helped explain their obsession with the purity of their blood. To do this, I made a conventional high fantasy choice and gave them silver gold hair, purple eye, purple and violet eyes, fine chiseled aristocratic features. That worked well enough, at least in the books. And in parentheses, he says, on the show, less so. But in recent years, it has occurred to me from time to time it might have made for an interesting twist if instead I had made the Dragon Lords of Valyria, and therefore the Targaryens, black. Maybe I could have kept the silver hair too, though... No, that comes too close to Dark Elf territory. But still, if I had dark-skinned dragon lords invade and conquer and dominate a largely white Westeros, Westeros, excuse me, though that choice would have brought its own perils, the Targaryens have not all been heroic after all. Some of them have been monsters, madmen, so. Well, it's all moot. The idea came about 20 years too late. So for the discussion, I want to ask, what do you guys think if the Valerians and therefore the, Tar- therefore the Targaryens were black? I agree with Martin when he says it probably comes with its own perils. Um, because yeah, a lot of the Targaryens, they tend to be exaggerated, if not completely insane in their personalities. And when you, I'm, I would say this is, this is sort of a pitfall of any show. If you have the one character of color or character that is gay or bisexual and they are really crazy you sort of run the risk of having uh, unfortunate implications. So I remember when um, we were talking about the gay characters of A Song of Ice and Fire, Oberyn and Ilaria are cool as bisexual representations, but because they're the only two we have, they also encompass the stereotypes of bisexual uh, promiscuity. And it could 
it's, it's without having lots of other bisexual people. So uh, I feel because the Targaryens, there are only so many of them. If they were your only people of color, that would have eh, brought some potential problems, unfortunate implications. That's the unfortunate thing because it, it should not be that uh, one character of color, one, one black character or one family of black characters shouldn't speak on behalf of all black characters. But that's something that we deal with in our real world where some when a black person does something, it sort of shames all black people when it should not be. Yeah, I agree. I think Martin could rectify this if like West Westeros itself was a bit more diverse and you had other like i don't know someone suggested make the starks like inuit that would have been an interesting choice or just make have more more people of color just in any one of the kingdoms um yeah that would have been an interesting choice having the starks be inuit yeah i thought that would be that would be very interesting that would just be nice to sort of add a bit more differentiation between these kingdoms right so yeah i mean then and then we would criticize then people would probably criticize the blood sacrifice aspect of their heritage as well well i feel like we see a lot of a lot of the northerners there are many northern characters and that way you're less likely to run into problems of unfortunate implications like oh i see oh i see you were just saying oh, make only the starks inuit not all the northern houses gotcha either or i would say it, but, uh, but just yeah. the fact that we see so many northern northern characters and like they're very diverse in their personalities and stuff that's that's it's a, it would be a lot harder to to to, to make sort of mistakes like that yeah I think the problem with um, like if if Martin had originally written the Targaryens as darker skin to make them seem more other to the pe of of the people of Westeros, once because so many of the early ones were just like in, just all all the incest and that shit craziness is by the time we got to the World Book and we actually and like Duncan Egg and we knew more of the backstory of the Targaryens and you did have good Targaryen rulers and just good Targaryens in general, it would have seemed like Martin rewriting his history to make them seem less other as a conquering people. Like it, it would have the problem of like almost the exact opposite problem. It would seem always like apologetic compared to trying to increase diversity in the later books. I don't know if I've said that back to front or the wrong way around. And I guess uh, maybe it's too late to mention this, but one thing in this world that's awesome is that no one, there's really no concept of race. It's more about the region where you came from. So for the Targaryens, if they were black, to be very invested in blood purity and, and that sort of thing, it's not because, it wouldn't be because they're black and we want to keep ourselves being black. Though I guess some people might read too much into it and see it that way. They know it's, it's, it's the Targaryen stay Targaryen. Ugh. The all important blood of the dragon. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's right. It's, it's all we're dancing around here is, yeah, it's like as soon as you, as soon as you make a, a character um, non white that's being read by, um, by, re you know, readers who are white, it, it, it just always involves a deeper scrutiny of, of all of their actions. And, and um, picking out, you know, is uh, whether or not this is a, a racist portrayal or, you know, how they're writing. It just involves a lot more scrutiny of all their negative actions that they appear and relating it to, um, you know, whatever culture they may be from. And is that being insulting to that culture and all this other stuff? Right. But I, I read um, the post when uh, Martin's post, when you put it on the forums, I haven't come across Dark Elves in fantasy, so I didn't know what it was talking about. I haven't had time to research it, and I, I guess that's because I haven't read as, right widely, oh, read as widely as other people. But are there examples of that? Like he just like, he just meant like the look of them. Like that's how that's how Dark Elves like look. 
like essentially isn't like Dritz, uh, like Drizit. Yeah, Drizit's a, like a dark elf with silver hair. A drow? I, so. I think that's what they call them. Right, I, I haven't yeah. read that series. I just know of Drizit the drow. Yes. Right. Yeah. They're what's it, right. what's a Drizit and where is it from? It's I a, can't, where is that character? It's just like a famous character out of the Dungeons and Dragon world, and like they, you know, there's a whole series of like short stories and novels um, about him um, that you can read about. Um, it's yeah, also it's like, I guess most of my fantasy tr- tropes come from like World of Warcraft, where I'm like the night elves are blue. Oh, yeah, the night elves are blonde. white skinned, right? Yeah, yeah, the blood, blood elves are like white skinned, blonde hair or silvery hair as well, and then like the night elves are like blue. And more silvery hair. Yeah, I mean, it's just like it's more, yeah, it's more older traditional fantasy stories that probably include them as a race. Yeah, no, I don't read many um, novels that include them as well. Um, I mean, the yeah, the the one I do is is Malazan, who he has an analog for the elves known as the Tisti, and so you divide them into three, where um, one is uh, pale with you know blonde hair, one is dark skinned with silver hair and the other one is is just the color of shadow um so they're all gray um but yeah overall like i don't um i don't read a lot of um kind of the older um fantasy novels that that include kind of your traditional representation of elves a good example would be uh in the elder scrolls series the there are literal dark elves yeah um I forget what their actual race name is. Oldmer is High Elves. Bosmer, I guess, doesn't really matter. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I don't remember. Dun, Dunmer. That's it. That's it. <laughs> okay, I guess on a lighter note, um, if the Targaryens were black, how would R plus L equal J work? Because <laughs> I feel <laughs> like... Poorly? <laughs> it wouldn't yeah it would you're right it wouldn't work because <laughs> they just be like, like yo that, that's clearly not your son there uh, uh ned uh what, what you doing <laughs> well you could change the us, a, a little like story of like ned going all over the door and trying to find like a you know a wet nurse that he can be like oh yeah that's the mom definitely the mom uh don't ask too many questions Sure, we totally believe you, even though Rhaegar was black himself. Yeah, it's <laughs> right. You was yeah. I, I would, like the only way you could get away with this is probably making like a Shardane black, and then just like have that claim be it, and just claim that she's the mother. I was thinking you about could, um, change the genetics of like the entire sort of yeah. men, and where and George has shown he's he's no stranger to playing around with genetics. Um, when it doesn't suit what he wants and have white people features be dominant uh, as opposed to black people features. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> but that, Ooh, that's, and that can that's, explain again. like the Targaryen like race, uh, uh, Targaryen blood purity, like oh, well, yeah. a lot well, it already better does. because they're like, no. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, see, I, right, that is true. He just applies because the Targaryens all have recessive genes. So you just apply that to them even if they are black i was thinking about it like um there are some people like you when in uh interracial relationships where their child can pass for white even if the father is of a darker complexion yeah so it's not out of the and this is a fantasy story so it's not out of possible like the realm of possibility it, it's just kind of funny right yeah it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he would. Yeah, that would that would have to be what it is. Is that he was more light skinned than that? He just claimed that the mother is from Dorne, and they would probably believe it. Well, as as you say, it's a fantasy series, so it can the rules can be whatever George wants. Right, yeah, that's be. true. But, you know, you know, it, yeah. I get. But I can also see some complaints from black readers that are like, why doesn't so John is black, but he's not really black? Oh uh, yeah, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> You get into colorism, which is a thing. Um, I, I thought it would be funny, like, um, if Jalabar Zo, instead of Cersei and Jamie being a thing, like, what if it was like Titus that, uh, what is, what is it? Titus Andronicus? That Shakespeare play? Yeah, that's, a, that's the name of it. I haven't seen it. No, I think, um, one of the, the queen, instead of, uh, she gets into a relationship with a black, uh, I forget who he is, but, I was wondering, like, what if that happened instead? It was Jala Barzo and Cersei instead of Jamie. 
and so, and so then <laughs> Joffrey and and all of them are. It was just like instead of like he would write them as like uh, their skin is always so sun kissed, they're always so tan. Going on to going back to the the list of characters we can talk about in the first book, um, we have, I think the first Summer Islanders we do meet is Chitai and Alayaya. Or do we meet uh, Jalabazo first? Yeah, I, I just kind of assume that Jalabazo is in the background before anyone else. I think he's in Game of Thrones, and we meet Shataya and Alyaya in Clash of Kings. Yeah, that's how I would um, imagine it without doing research here. No, I so I like no, go ahead. Shataya and Alyaya. I think they're cool. Um, but obviously they're prostitutes, and um, I know... The, the, again, this is this is a, a problematic trope that often appears where you have black people exclusively appearing as prostitutes. Um, you also have the exotic erotic trope where people of color are exotic. They have like sexualized um, quite a bit. So again, I like the characters, but I'm just aware that these are problematic tropes that are that are that are also there as well. Yes, I, I'm going to give him uh, a compliment and a critique. I, I like that Chitai. I mean, yeah, Chitai is a, a business owner. She has her own thing going on. She's successful in her field. But at the same time, I do dislike what you were talking about, the sexuality of it. I, I'm i not really a fan also of the idea that the Summer Islanders are so... I feel like this is a problem with other characters of color as well, like the Dothraki. Like, they're so free sexuality, and it goes back to what we were talking about with the linear reread. Like, it's more of a masturbatory fantasy, I think, than an actual legitimate, like, bit of world-building culture. Yeah, it is interesting when you look at the uh, sexualization of these other cultures that happen to be people of color, where and then you go and compare it to something like the wildlings or even the ironborn who are they're also other cultures but they're not sexualized um or even the free cities um or they're they're a little bit maybe free cities maybe aren't the best example but you have these white other cultures that are not sexualized in the same way yeah i mean they have they have like some of those um i mean yeah, like some of the the prostitute houses um in like was it in Bravos and stuff the um and who's like the most like famous like Corazon over there oh the, the Black Pearl yeah the Black Pearl yeah Ooh, talk about good segues yes <laughs> the Black Pearl is Belagir Otheris who was a smuggler trader occasional pirate and captain of the Widow Wind and. Um, we're going back to, uh, I guess we should have mentioned this earlier, but this is going back to what if the Targaryens were black again? Because here we have not just a hypothetical, but there's a chance that she gave birth to three bastards um, of Aegon the Unworthy. She had a, two daughters, Bellinora and Narha, and a son who she named Balerion. Which is kind of funny because she named him Balerion, who is the Black Dread, but <laughs> I guess... Um, so yeah, um, what do you guys think of that? <laughs> so I'm trying to like look her up real quick. I actually don't know like what race of people she is. <laughs> she's uh, she's a, a Islander. 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 Oh, she is. Oh, I yeah. never knew that. <laughs> it's one of those things I don't often I don't pay attention enough to like descriptions of some of the characters in the in the free cities and stuff as much as I should. No, like she's there is... like literally like the Black Pearl is from because she's black. <laughs> Right, yeah, that's, that's and there's a picture of her in the world of ice and fire. As well. uh, okay, gotcha. The nine loves of Aegon the Unworthy. Yeah. Um, again, she seems cool. Uh, I would like to know more about her. Um, I also like the 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 line of black pearls, which are the these very uh, the well, she is the most famous courtesan in in the group of courtesans. But here we again, we have another. Um... Another black woman who is famous in this world, but she is a prostitute. Um, but before that, she was a smuggler. She was a bit of a pirate, which is awesome. She's a strong character. But again, I, I also, I would like to know more about her and more into the mystery of the the parentage of her, the paternity of her children. There's a possibility that there there was out there a half black, half uh, 
Valerian heir to the throne because after he died, he famously made all his bastards legitimate. <laughs> yeah, I tend to believe that these these are well, at least some of them are Aegon's children because it, it mentions in the World of Ice and Fire she had she had a different lover in every port, but like at least Valerian, I just sort of feel like that's 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 the way George was going. That's the one. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That at least, I don't think that she would, I mean, I don't know much about the character other than what they're, other than that very brief entry for her, but I don't think she would name her child Balerion if she was not convinced that he was, in fact, of the Targaryen bloodline. Yeah. It would be great if, like, uh, in, like, book six or seven, we get, like, a Killmonger character coming over trying to get the throne from Daenerys and Aegon. <laughs> Maybe she's the third head of the dragon. It could happen. <laughs> that would be awesome. I fully endorse this idea um, just because I need more Michael B. Jordan in my life and Michael B. Jordan in Game of Thrones would be epic. Oh. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan on the back of a dragon? That would... Don't. We're going to get into inappropriate territory and I don't need people <laughs> hearing this. Shirtless on the back of a dragon. Um... <laughs> Talking about sexualizing characters, um, hmm, it's all right. I'm a hypocrite. I get it. No, it's fine. He was shirtless throughout that movie. Um, but speaking of black dragon riders, we can go on and talk about Nettles, who is of mysterious origins and uh, racially ambiguous. We never find out if she's actually um, Summer Islander or not, but she's mentions this having mud brown skin, which is awful. Yeah. But she was a dragon rider during the Dance of the Dragons. She famously tamed the dragon sheep stealer. And she also um, did some very not cool things like having affair with, uh, what is her name, Renara's husband? Damon, Damon something. Damon Targaryen. You mean, da yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's still unclear as to what their exact relationship was. Oh, I thought that was cool that they were getting it on. Right, yeah, no, I kind of liked it too. I mean, but but there is the underage aspect of it. Oh, how old is... I thought she, she was like 16? Oh, yeah. well, I guess, yeah, that is sorry, underage. Sorry, sorry, um, Und yeah, underage in our world, not so much in, in, their, in their world. Um, so, but yeah, but it, it was still, yeah, but it was, it's still, it's, it's still unclear as to whether or not it, it was a, a lover's relationship or more of a father-daughter relationship. Um... Also, it was never confirmed that they were actually having a sexual relationship. Or... Well, no, I no, of course not. Just because it, you know, it's written, it's written from the history book from a maester, so they're just going off stories. You know, they have no definitive proof one way or the other. But it, it was obviously a rumor going around. Right, right, right. Okay. Um... I feel like a like a father daughter relationship should look very clearly different from a romantic relationship. Like, even Mesa should be able to pick up on that, but, yeah. Right, but it's not, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah. second, it's a second hand account. Yeah, I know. That's just me being creeped out a little because I'd forgotten about, I just thought it was romantic and then forgotten about that, that there was that question there. Yeah. Um, so we do have a theory that mm -hmm. she is the, with the burned men in, uh, of the mountain tribes, that she is the, um, hold on. I'm going to have to edit this out because I forgot what the name of that character was. Does anybody know what the, uh, the burned men who they worship the, the goddess? Uh, the I mean, goddess? right. I think it was, I think it was pretty clear that, that she was essentially, you know, the, the origin of the burned men. Yeah. I take, I take this as canon. Yeah. Like, so I'm looking at the uh, Wiki of Ice and Fire, and it says some maces believe that the burned men originated from members of the painted dogs who worshipped the fire witch and her dragons in the mountains of the moon following the dance. So yeah, it's it's one of those mysteries that's not specifically solved or resolved, like concrete, but it's kind of obvious that yeah, she is the fire witch. Yeah. And yeah, and I really, I, I really like that origin story. That was one of my favorite little, 
um, tidbits from reading Fire and Blood. So from Nettles, an annoying theory that really annoys me has sprung up. A lot, um, a lot of people have said, oh, Nettles proves you don't need to have Blood of the Dragon to ride a dragon um, and with, because she's brown. And I've, this, this yeah, kind of have, enrages me. We have no idea what her origin is. Um, but, but it's like, we have so many examples of like Targaryen or Valyrian features working in like a, a, I don't know, what would you call it? Genetically recessive manner. Um, that, yeah, it annoys me when people use nettles as proof that, um, you don't need dragon blood. Like, no, she very, well, in my opinion, which is right, cause it's my opinion. She very clearly is a dragon seed. Yeah. Is Yeah. And, uh, and they're. And it's it's not like you need a lot, <laughs> you know, to, to ride a dragon. It's really, you know, you can just have, you know, a drop, and then it's a, and then it's just luck of the draw beyond that. Um, as as evidenced by Brown Ben Plum, who is half of every race on this on what what do they call it, Planetos, and he is he was favored by Danny's dragons, right. And I think that's in a great example of the fact that, yes, you do need some dragon blood to be a dragon rider, because why would Martin include that little bit where Viserion lands on him if not to say, hey, you need Valerian blood? You need Valerian blood and to feed them if Brown Blum, Plum and Nettles is anything to go by. Yeah, and One drop yeah. in food. And like in the in the world book and fire and blood have been very clear about um, the whole concept of the dragon seeds and just like how me- and how prolific they were. So Brown Ben Plum uh, claims to be what was this? His grandmother was a summer islander or something. Um, are we are we going? Are we using the one drop rule in Westeros or in Planetos? So does he count as black? Uh huh. Oh man, I feel so uncomfortable uh, saying like one drop rule over yeah, and over again because I keep thinking like, oh god, no one can get married before like 1970 in some states. I understand what he's uh, saying, so I, I'm not taking offense. That I I do know the real world uh, one drop rule is awful, but I do understand what his point is. Um, no, because I said it as well, and I'm like, oh wait, this is the only way to explain this. Hmm. Australians. No, it's, oops. It's, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was an offensive term. I've just read it on Wikipedia. The one yeah. drop rule was a thing where if you had just any black person in your lineage, you were considered black and therefore you were banned from doing all sorts of things that you needed to do to be a part of society. But in this context, we're talking about um, Valerian blood. So I guess maybe to not get un- more uncomfortable we should not you say one drop but just talk about valerian's uh bloodlines and a- yeah uh but brown ben i guess no he would not be considered black no i would, I would say probably not i think because more because so- is he even telling the truth with regards to all of all of the uh Oh, I get yeah. a sense there's a lot of tall tales in right, what yeah, he tells Danny. There's yeah, there's no way it includes you know everything, um, but no, he he certainly is. Um, I forget what the genetic term is of of just kind of you know a bunch of the process when a, you know a bunch of different races cohabitate together. The, the term used in the books is an amiable mongrel, which has all sorts of, again, uh, unfortunate implications. But right, that's, yeah, that's what... no, I was just like, I've, I've been like looking up stuff on the Wiki of Ice and Fire here just to kind of figure out exactly like what race, you know, each nation is supposed to be. And yeah, I was mm-hmm. looking up like the old Gascari and yeah, they're literally just described as like, a, a you know, a collection of, of mongrel people. I'm just like, well, <laughs> that doesn't help me at all. And it's offensive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But these terms are being thrown about by characters in the world. So it's not, you know, it's not us, dear listeners, right, who right, right. it's the characters who don't know how to be politically correct. Yeah. We could do bitter, like there are bits of everything. Yeah. yeah. But that's, yeah. But, Probably um, will become the same way. Uh, 
But I thought um, Brown Ben Plum was just really good at spitting tales and was ambiguous looking enough to be everything to everyone he wanted to be, which I thought was quite charming and dangerous about his character, which I liked. Um, mm -hmm. But he could definitely play to his crowd very well. Yeah, Whoever and, yeah, and I would say was the... being at the time. Yeah, and I would say at least the Targaryen lineage is pretty much, um, I take that as, as fact, um, that he is, you know, related to Helena Targaryen. Mm -hmm. He is definitely um, someone who has a relative that was um, melanated, if that's... <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he is brown. <laughs> it's just not we, we're just not sure who or from where but um yeah he's a character who i dislike because of his um turn cloak nature i feel like yeah like you said donna um that he always wants to at least have i think you said that donna that he always wants to have somewhere to turn and by saying that he's one of each nation he can always just claim to be that and run in that direction oh that's yeah. interesting i never thought of it in that context <laughs> yeah so yeah i mean so see so, yeah, i'm looking at his wiki here so like the facts we at least know is that he's part he's half dothraki like his mother was dothraki uh and he's also got um ibanese and and cohort in there um so i would imagine that probably the the shade of his skin is most related to um his dothraki heritage um although that gets that gets confusing with between the the show and the books and that they're supposed to be more of the Mongolian culture. I do hope he dies in between the sixth or seventh books because he's awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm about to say, like, I think, I think he's going to, you know, survive at least the next battle. Um, as he's going to, I just enjoy honesty. seeing what he's going to do next. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I like a shit sterile, mainly because they, just dash it. Um, yeah, no, I actually... It's interesting to see what they do. Yeah. I really enjoy it. Yeah, I really like this character. And yeah, I was on a reread recently where it was it was the chapter essentially right before... Or it's the chapter like when he decides to essentially um, betray Danny. And I thought it was a, a fascinating um, portrayal of his of his character. And you kind of just... You see him want to want to support Danny and, and give her advice and... Uh, and then once she's like unwilling to to take that advice, he immediately begins to to plan how he's going to um, to escape the city and betray her, and then join the um, the approaching um, other mercenary companies. And I I really enjoyed that chapter. And you yeah, can kind of you can feel his betrayal because he's like, "Are you sure you're not going to use your dragons?" And right? Like, yeah. No. And you're like, are you really sure? <laughs> <laughs> can you put this in writing? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm giving you every opportunity here. <laughs> Please. Please. <laughs> yeah. Uh Michael, you I think you were gonna say something. No, I was just gonna say that exactly. You can like see the wheels turning in his head and he's like, Alright, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> but now he's in this weird sp oh well I guess we can uh that's uh Winds of Winter chapter spoilers and I promise none of that. Um uh, okay. well, I mean he's at least talk I mean, you see the end of Tyrion's arc and, and dances him talking with Brown Ben Plum. So, but speaking of uh, Danny betrayers or potential or potential Danny betrayers, that brings us around to probably one of the most en enigmatic black characters introduced in a Game of Thrones, and that is Makoro. Yeah, I like that he can get his visions right. <laughs> um, which is a nice change for the, the followers of the Red God. Um, he's clearly the best at it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he is very enigmatic. Right, yeah. No, he, I mean, he, see, he seems like an awesome character, and I'm excited to see what he does. But yeah, we know very little about him to really um, judge him and, and, uh, and, or analyze his character in a um, uh, deep manner. He's one of those characters that I really want a point of view from, but it, if it was, it would be like prologue or epilogue, and I definitely don't want him to be in a prologue or an epilogue like point of view because I don't want him to die. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. I want to get in that head, but 
not in the way that it, you know, ends up normally. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll eventually, um, get more of his motivations in, in future books, but I imagine we won't really see that until he, he meets Danny as that is kind of his main goal at this point. He reminds me a bit of Marwin the mage in that both of them have this well unsavory reputation. I mean, like the first thing we see Makoro do is he tells Victorian after his hand is healed to, to cut the maester's throat and they'll give, they'll get favorable wins. Um, but both seem to want to serve Daenerys and, but both seem to be grayish characters, which actually makes me wonder, um, this is something a lot of people have been guessing or predicting is Danny's going to have a lot of advisors at some point. He's frightening in a way that I can't really describe because he's the real deal. Whereas Melisandre doesn't know what she's doing most of the Mm -hmm. time. He knows exact everything he's saying comes true. He's obviously very, very powerful and he's aligned himself with the Ironborn and they have the dragon horn. And as someone whose favorite character is Daenerys, I don't know if I should be happy he's on his way to her because he can definitely do her many favors when it comes to learning maybe how to tame her dragons, seeing the future and that sort of thing. Or is he going to be a, uh, a betrayer? Yeah, so I, I guess I'll say another comparison I want to make between specifically with Marwin and Makoro is also to to Blood Raven, um, where um, I feel like I mean, so Marwin and Makoro are going to to Danny in the same way that um, Blood Raven reached out to to Bran, and so that their their overall goal is is to help them along, um, and they're also very uh, capable individuals. Um, but, uh, they're, they're helping out these, these protégés along, um, because those protégés abilities are, are needed, um, in, you know, presumably the overall war. And they, they, they feel like characters who, um, are more concerned about their higher purpose than they are, um, individual people. And so that I think they're, they're more willing to um, sacrifice the the lives um, of people in order to achieve the, their greater good and or their their higher goal of of essentially you know beating the others. And so that might and those two things might come into conflict with some of their their proteges who are much more um, concerned about the well being of of humanity. Maybe that's why he does come across as dangerous in a, a really hard to pin down way like that you know people working for the greater good um are able to do such horrific things but justify them but i i'm not so much looking forward to like him meeting daddy because you know i feel like that will go fine i just really want him to meet mel and put her in her place but that's me just yes. I, I want yeah. that too. Yeah. yeah. I just want it so bad. And especially since the last reread and um, where they were talking about maybe, you know, it, it visions are more like breadcrumbs. So all these um, followers of the Lord of Light, like Roll Up, will end up in the same place but getting there differently. Because he gets his vision so much i don't know if that applies to him or maybe he has just more confidence in it i don't know yeah like, i mean he's yeah. like he, he seems doesn't to... seem like getting breadcrumbs he seems yeah. to be getting like a loaf right he seems <laughs> to he seems to like be able to direct what visions he gets he seems to be able to say like okay i need to know this piece of information here like tell me what i need to know um and yeah, and so that he's not, you know, following some trail. He's just going immediately to the end of whatever question he needs answered. Unfortunately, Michael, we're going to have to start talking about the show. No, um, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a quote from John Boyega where he talks about diversity on this series. And I'm going to read it so I don't mince his words as well. He, he flat out says, there are no black people on Game of Thrones. You don't see one black person in Lord of the Rings. I ain't paying money to always see one type of person on screen because you see different people from different backgrounds, different cultures every day. Even if you're racist, you have to live with that. We can ruffle up some feathers. And I assume that he means by ruffling up feathers, that means we can be more inclusive 
with uh, casting. So I don't agree entirely with what he says. Uh, I think it like factually it's not true. But um, I just want to hear you guys' thoughts on maybe what do you guys think of what he said? Um, I mean, yeah, like it's it's just a it's just a criticism of um fantasy in in general um where it was just you know it's been very often eurocentric um so that the casting on the show you know mostly um fit the descriptions of the characters um in the books but it's just that the fact that the books were so um eurocentric that very homogenous yeah it became an issue um, so yeah, so no, I, I agree. I agree with his general statement. I just don't think it's, it's as much in this aspect a criticism on the show. They, I mean, there are some problems. I would say mainly the main problem with casting on the show was that that white savior moment at the end of like season five or six or something. Um, season but, three, I think. Oh, really? Was it, it that doesn't, early? Doesn't up, but yeah. Um, but yeah, but but like beyond that, I thought they were fairly. Uh, I thought they were fairly accurate in their um, in their casting of um, of various Essos characters. Um, yeah, the main the main issue was that the the slaves in in Marine and Astapor and all that are a wide mix of all races because they're just they bring in slaves from all over um, the world. But to talk on to clear that up right quick, it's just. I do. I understand, or what I read, that they only had predominantly brown skin actors because of where they filmed, and they it would uh, yeah. wouldn't have been feasible to to like fill yeah. in a more diverse cast. So I can Fair enough. from a technical standpoint, I understand that. So I, I don't criticize the show for it's it's kind of a unfortunate accident. But um, let me uh, cede the floor to you other guys so you can comment on his quote. Um, uh, j- just with that scene, I'm I'm a, a lot more critical of them because like. Like, how do you not recognize what, what, what's going on? Right, how do you not see what you're like, doing? Yeah. If if you're that desperate for extras, just get, like, the, the B camera crew to go in and pretend they're um, slaves or whatever. Like, <laughs> how hard... It, yeah, no, I just... They were all black, too. The, <laughs> the camera <laughs> crew. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, they would probably, you know, they would hire local, <laughs> um, just, you know, cameramen as well. Get, okay, get David and Dan to, to cameo <laughs> as some slaves. I know they're white, but that that is a good point. Like, um, if you have um a cast or if your extras are all brown skin, maybe you should have handled the situation a little bit better by not having her crowd surf on them while they <laughs> call her mother. Yeah. Um. But yeah, going to the quote, um. God, I don't want to defend the show. There are some black, oh, black people of color um, in the show. Not that there's many, um, but I do. I definitely. I think it's more what he's saying in general, like Westeros. When you get to Westeros, and it is yeah. so very homogenous. Um, and again, we're getting back to this is a fantasy. You know, George could have written it any way he wanted, um, but for whatever reason, it turned out in this way. Um, it's it's yeah it, it it's an issue <laughs> yeah but that is a good point because this is a late statement something i wanted to mention earlier but when you talk about diversity in in media there are those people that rush out to say why don't why aren't you more concerned with how the story is being told why are you focusing on this instead of a better story like that should be casting should be one of the last things you think about and people get really, really defensive when you talk about including more characters of color, other minorities, like gay people, people of different religions. I just want to say as a black reader, a black show watcher, I don't, I'm not uh, upset with how the story is being told his decisions to and make the world the w- look the way it looks because he's telling his own story. I completely understand that if I wanted to read a different type of story that, One of the most offensive things that people say when you have these arguments is that um, if you want to read a story with more black people in it, why don't you go write it yourself? I know I can do that. We're just talking about what we're given and how it's being handled. So, 
But I will say this um, with Lord of the, with his comments saying you don't see one black person in Lord of the Rings. I did go see The Hobbit, and there were in the Hobbit trilogy there were black actors in the background. And having seen so many fantasy series set in medieval Europe with no black people, it was so fucking jarring to see a black person running around as a peasant. That <laughs> I, I almost flew out of my seat. <laughs> I had no idea. I never noticed that. Yeah, when they go to um, Dale, um, outside the Dwarf City, as as you're getting more east, yeah, they have some black extras. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go on a little tangent about The Hobbit. Um, when they have Bale the Bard, and um, I always had trouble telling him apart because he looks basically like Aragorn. Um, and other people have pointed out, oh, you'll have people of color as extras, but you won't have them as the main characters. To me, it would be the, the, the most, like, it's, it's a no-brainer to just cast Bale the Bard, uh, or Bard the Bowman as, uh, um, as a person of color. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know why they didn't do this. I, yeah. It would I have been was... perfectly fine. And another thing that you hear from people is like, the term blackwashing, which I don't think it exists. When it comes to fantasy, a lot of these stories were written during a time where the writers weren't thinking of a wider audience. They were themselves typically white men, straight white men who were not thinking, well, there are black people reading my story. Let me, I know H.P. Lovecraft wasn't thinking of uh, people of color yeah. in any positive regard. So when it comes to, we, the reason we have so many white protagonists is because of the time they were written. So if you want to change Bale to a black character, it's because, sure, why not? It's not, he's not a character whose race, his, his character is not determined by his race, and it's perfectly safe to do that. Yeah, I guess All right, so. I'm reading the Wikipedia um, <laughs> article on Bard the Bowman, and da, 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 da. yeah, yeah as far, there is nothing about what he looks like in any capacity. So it, again, it was, it, was, it was right open there, and they did not take that. And you get into the uh, mind, like when you don't have descriptions of characters, that's kind of when your mind automatically casts them in, like as white, as if white is the default, which it kind of is when you're mm -hmm. when you're reading things. Right. I would say, yeah, your, your mind casts them as I would assume essentially whatever, you know, whatever race you are. <laughs> and then and even when writers specifically say this character is a person of color people tend not to like skip over it. Like there was a whole controversy with the Hunger Games series with Rue, people being upset that she was a black oh, yeah. actress. They had no Even, idea. Yeah. It's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, one question I wanted to ask is is what your guys' thoughts were on the uh, the Dornish casting in the show. Just because like personally I never had a problem with it. Um and I don't know. I was kind of curious to hear um, other people in, in the fandom's op uh, opinion on it. I thought it was fine. I, yeah, again, I didn't have any problems. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was that was basically how, like George says that describes them as Mediterranean. Um, yeah, I will say it is. It is. I guess what would you call it? There are potential issues when you have Dawn, it has people of color, and it's inspired by a lot of uh, real-world counterparts. So you have Spain, uh, Wales, even Palestine. Um, and what am I trying to say? It's it, it, it can yeah it can be awkward when you're sort of Whereas some of the other kingdoms, like the Reach, for instance, which is inspired by France, and that appears to be it. Um, when you're when you're smashing all of these 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 uh, inspiring cultures together. Okay, so yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that there were like other there was stuff like Wales and Palestine in there. I always just took them to uh, to basically just be um, Spain and Morocco and just all that area and all of that area entails i didn't know what olive skin meant when i read this books the first time and i didn't look it up so i just always in my head i had them be like a a tan people or like a, a they were melanated in my mind but i didn't think that they were i didn't think of one specific race or nationality not nationality but i didn't I, yeah i didn't have in mind any particular location when it came to the characters i just knew in my head that they were people of color 
So when I saw Pedro Pascal was cast, and I forget the actress who's playing um, Adira Varma. Yeah, from Rome. Um, I I thought that was perfect. I was like, that's kind of exactly yeah. what I saw in my head. Yeah, no, and they were like all of, like <laughs> their actors are all over the place. Like I don't know if many people realize this, but <laughs> Colleen Wing plays one of the Sand Snakes. <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like it's silly. <laughs> like they're all like the actors are all are from all over the place. Um, with you know we got South America, we got Asia, we got the Middle East, like all all in there. Michael, you brought up one character that we almost forgot, who is a person of color, who is Alaris, and he, excuse me, she. It's hard to descri- it's hard to describe the character because it, it's. It's a mystery. We don't know if, for sure, if it's Solaris who is um one of the Sand Snakes. Well, speaking of the Sand Snakes, I, I mean, I take that as canon. Um, yeah. so, so but we haven't had the reveal yet that right, oh, so I'm who, actually a woman. Who's, who's Sorella's mother? She's I, a Summer Islander. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's another thing. Just didn't didn't pick up on. <laughs> Did not pay attention to. <laughs> But yeah, she's a summer islander. Um, he, Sorellis or Alaris. Uh, I'm just gonna say she because it, it yeah, it's canon. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. She's one of the sand snakes. She's masquerading as Alaris, which is her name backwards in uh, the Citadel, just for fun, pushing boundaries. I, I testing limits, and uh, yeah, that's the character. Um, let's discuss. I mean, like I mean, she's another one like Makoro who. Um, we don't know much about yet, but I'm just, you know, super excited to see. I feel um, like this is a common trend with all of these characters. It's like, yeah, I, I would like to know more about them. We don't get a lot of information. <laughs> right. Well, that's just because they were introduced, you know, later in the series when, you know, most of the characters were of color were, were introduced. Yeah, she seems cool. Um, she's got her bow. Um, she always misses her last shot. And because she says the day you hit them all is the day you stop improving, that's a, it, that, that's a very overing thing to say. Mm-hmm. I'm just so excited for Sam's storyline in general, um, just to learn more about Old Town and and the Citadel, and we got Euron coming, and you know we got Sorella there, we got a faceless man there. Like it's 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 all gonna be exciting. Mm-hmm. A lot of ingredients in this pot to be stirred. Yeah. I am really looking forward to her, just the sheer amount of like, just eye rolls that she'll probably have for Sam, just because she's like, <laughs> oh, so yeah. effing naive. Just the best, like, the best side eye. <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, why? Why do I have to deal with you? Wouldn't it be great if Sam just died and Alaris took over? <laughs> just became his POV. <laughs> um, yeah. all right. Unfortunately, she, she, she's one of those characters that I just oh, I'm so excited about. I want more of her. I want her to be like the main person that shows Sam around Old Town and shows him the ropes of the Citadel. Just because the more of her, the better. Just because I find her so fascinating. Um, just yeah. Oh, yeah, and hopefully, yeah, there is more of her. But. Oh. Uh, yeah, I would assume that's the exact role that she's going to play is to be a, a mentor for Sam in Marwin's place. He makes a lot of uh, Sam meets a lot of Summer Islanders. I noticed, or well, well, three so far. No, no, he meets the two well, on just, the boat. Right, he's I mean, rescued by one. No, I mean it's well, it's the entire crew of the Sim and Wind essentially, because um, yeah. yeah, it's it's the captain who rescues him in um, the Bravos. That's what happens right, when you're right. in a lot of ports. I thought it was a crewman. Like... I mean, it doesn't matter. I oh, thought okay. it was someone called no, no, no. Kondo, but then the the captain is Kahuro Mo. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. And Kahuro Mo is the character. I have in my notes that he's the one that tells Danny that Robert Baratheon is dead. Yeah, Danny mm-hmm. um, meets him in uh, in Karth. Right. So something that I also found interesting in, in the Clash of Kings when he's talking to Danny is he initially says, oh, I can't take you back to Westeros. I'm actually going to uh, further east. I'm going to do the Trader's Circuit and I won't be back in the Narrow Sea for like two or three years. 
Um, but obviously, changes happen to the timeline, and I guess guess he turned around. He changed his mind. <laughs> right. It's, it's probably when George was still planning on doing the five year gap. Maybe there was I don't know a plague in Yt, and he was like, "No, nope, turning my ship around. Don't want to deal with that." Yeah. He should have just been like, "Your dragons aren't big enough yet. You're not. You haven't leveled up en- enough for me to take you to Westeros. <laughs> See you later." <laughs> No, you have... must be at least uh, this level to to access this quest. To ride. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, she has a lot of potential to be an excellent character. It's unfortunate that she's weighted down by Sam, the sad sack. So I, I hope that she still gets to shine and do cool things. She's one of the minor characters like, um, what is his name? Uh... She's one of the minor characters that I've like taken a uh, really good interest in, and I hope that she doesn't die because it would be really just petty to have them killed. Like, um, I think we talked in the linear reread about Satin, who's a minor character that I hope doesn't die. Gotcha. No, I, I'm looking forward to her reveal. Like, she stays in character like the entire time they're in the Citadel, and when Sam finally gets to go back to the North with all of his knowledge and be, you know, the teacher of, like, what he knows now. And then she's like, oh, yeah, I'll come along with you just to keep you company. And she arrives, and she's like, oh, yeah, time to get the bow out. And everyone's like, what? And it's just like, <laughs> oh, yeah, boom. And I just, oh. If I had a tail, I'd be wagging because we're talking about her. Like, just <laughs> Um, but while we are talking about Sam and um, the Summer Islanders he encounters, um, when he is on the Cinnamon Wind, he gets the uh, speech from, well, it's from the captain through his daughter about how he needs to have sex with Gilly. Um, and just be a happier person in general. Yes, please. Where is, <laughs> let me let me see if I can find it exactly. Okay, here it is. I can paraphrase, you... uh, for Christ's sakes, get your end wet. <laughs> all, all you Westerosi make shame of loving. There is no shame in loving. If your septons say there is, your seven gods must be demons. In the isles, we know better. Our gods gave us legs to run, noses to smell with, hands to touch and feel. What mad, cruel god would give a man eyes and tell him he must forever keep them shut and never look at all the beauty in the world? Only a monster, god, a demon of darkness. And then, then he goes on to say, yeah, have sex with Gilly, she's lonely. Um, I, I bring this up because, as, did this remind anyone else of the, the uh, magic Negro stereotype, where the main character is given the necessary skills or ability to solve his problems by the black supporting character? No. Ooh, badge of anting it. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I first thought of. N- not for me. Because she's not a, um, what is it, magical Negro? If, well, for me, it didn't, uh, it didn't, uh, trigger that in my mind because she's not really offering anything magical in that way. She's not, she's only giving him like very yeah, basic just, advice. Yeah, giving him good advice. Like, that. yeah, I don't, I don't see that. No, I, I mean, I, I, I like the speech and stuff. I was just like, is this. <laughs> Is this a racially problematic trope or is it not? I don't know. I don't think so. Although I will say, like, this speech kind of does bring up um, the idea of, of the stuff we've been talking about um, earlier here with just kind of the, the characters of color being more um, sexually promiscuous, where we're also, at the same time, we're kind of judging them by um, a Western standard where that's, you know, that's not considered... Um, the way to do things and and so i don't know i just feel like maybe it's not necessarily a criticism um of their characters it's just a, a criticism in our view of them well looking up the magical negro trope on um, wikipedia it, yeah there's no supernatural element to what she's saying so yeah it didn't i didn't connect the two but like Matt said, I, I did think of, once again, we have a character of color who is like, you should be more sexually liberated because that's how my culture is. And I kind of rolled my eyes at that. But um, having said that, even if the characters were white, 
I just find in in fantasy novels, there's always like this culture that's super sexually liberated where they just want to have they they don't understand the concept of like shame or nudity, and it's just so tired. I I always feel like it's more so a writer's sexual fan like they wish that this existed so they can take part in it because it, even in um the the wise man's fear by patrick rothfuss there was a oh, culture yeah. do, do you remember what are the uh the the, nin, the ninjas right yeah I, I know it's been so long since i read that book just because it's been so long since it came out um but yeah no that whole thing when he's going through when he's being being trained or whatever and yeah, yeah. She, she's just like all right well let's just take care of that and get back to to training yeah, no. I just always feel like that's the writer. I wish that there was a girl that would just be like, "You look like you're hard right now. Let's have sex and not yeah. talk about it afterwards." And it's just, it's so, so silly. Yeah, no, I kind, I kind of agree with you. It does feel um, like a self fantasy. And it does come from female characters because if you write a male character like that, they come across completely different. Yeah, and it's never, there's never gay, and there's never gay characters like that. Like even in in the Wise Men's Fear, there's n- you never hear him talking about I saw two dudes in a bush, like getting it on. Yeah, I'm about to say if you, yeah, if you want, there's there's one series that's that's pretty good with that stuff, and that's um, Jacqueline Carey um, and what she does with the uh, Kushel's Dart, especially, um, is pretty good. Um, if you're looking for a more um, sexually adventure adventurous fantasy series that does it well okay you can you can uh type that to me and i'll <laughs> yeah it did i mean yeah, yeah. it's like a, it's a mix between you know the fantasy and romance genre whereas yeah most like in most cases i just feel like um i mean even in, even in these books where you just get some scenes it's like man it just doesn't really belong in this story in this genre and if if that's the type of stuff you're looking for there are other there are other genres for that that you can go read that they're just written better yeah i don't know if i'm just getting older or not it's just like when i get to a sex scene i'm just like yeah no and i mean it didn't right yeah that's probably that it didn't really bother me on the first read through probably because you know i was like 16 17 at the time but yeah nowadays when i'm going back and reading through like i reread the the asha chapter um, that I think you guys discussed in the recent yeah. review the other day, and I was like, "Man, I, I hate everything about this." <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I said. <laughs> like, it's just so it's just so unnecessary. He could have just started the chapter like after they like just started the chapter after she woke up like in her room um, and disregarded all all of that sex scene. He 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 masturbates to his work. I know he does. But, um... <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, but I do. I want to bring up one one thing that um people might call me a sensitive liberal, but um in the uh, prologue of A Feast for Crows, Leo Tyrell shows up and he tells Alaris, or he insults her, like she's she's defending her friends as he keeps throwing shade at them. And he says something that, like, when I read it, my hat flew off my head. He um he says, your mother was a monkey from the Summer Isles. Oh, wow. And I know that he's not being, he, it's not because, well, it is because she's black, but it's, you know, calling someone a monkey in our world is is, is horrible. You know, it's right, close, yeah. very close to the N-word. It's and got I, a lot of context, yeah. And I just, it feels so out of place in this series because, there again, there's no race here. So I, I yeah. I don't get it. Yeah, what do you guys think of that? It, right. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's, it's definitely something that's um, right. It was something he was trying to write that was meant to be insulting, but it, it, the insult like probably wouldn't make much sense, like in the world of, of Westeros. Um, so it's something he's using from our world. Um, so yeah, it's, it definitely is out of place. There's also, there's also an interesting theory that Leo Tyra was doing that all, uh, all on purpose. To what end? Uh, and basically, in order to like clear them out and um, uh, leave, uh, get paid a loan, um, so that the um, faceless men could kill him. Mm. Well, it worked because damn that. Just... <laughs> right? Yeah. No. It's... 
there are other ways you could have done that. Like, it's, yeah, exactly. it, it, <laughs> he, um, Lazy Leo doesn't have to use a, an analog to a racist term in our world. To like, the, you can insult yeah. them in all other so ways. So many other things you could have done. He could have just farted or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just gotten drunk and like thrown up on them. It, that would have been so much better, but um, it just felt... You'd have to be jarring. brewing, like, a pretty killer fart to clear out that. <laughs> like, you, you would need, like, complete faith in your diet from, like, the past 48 hours and just going, you know what? I don't regret that chili. Just, uh, <laughs> just a special talent of his. But, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because it just seemed really uh, not quite in line with what we know. And it kind of... Something like that never happens again. Yeah, I remember reading it and just being like, oh, okay, that's a thing. And But yeah, it's the only time it seems to pop up. And again, I'm not, I don't think, I don't think George R. R. Martin is racist by any means. I do think that one, one thing I should have said earlier in this episode is like, this is a really diverse cast. The, the cast of this book is very, the series is very diverse. Like even for the time it was published, we have gay characters, we have female, strong female characters as leads. We have people of color being represented, like even as so far as the first book. So I do want to, I keep bashing him in these episodes, calling, I call him a pervert and shit, but he did a really good job with uh, including a lot of different people in this series. Well, we're, the reason we're criticizing his work and discussing it is because we like it so much. Like exactly. you, can, you can criticize something you like and still, still really like it. You do get haters who just pop up every wherever they can to just bash the series. But like I, I, I read these books and I reread these books and I watch the show because I do think that it's well written. And I'm I'm not saying that you know we do need it could it could use some work in di in, in different uh, areas. But overall, I don't hate these books or him as a writer. But um, to since we're on the topic of really horrible, uncomfortable things written in the series, well, go, going back to criticizing him, um, I do like. It's kind of funny how like each character, each black character that's introduced, it, they kind of get increasingly blacker as they go along. Like first, he says like their skin is as black as ebony, or their skin is as black. He'll say their skin is as black as like ebon, and then he'll say this character's skin is as black as Mas Maester's ink. And then he just goes on and is like, this person's skin is as black as pitch. And I'm like, this, <laughs> you can't get any blacker than that. I don't know what you're doing, sir. What color is oiled teak? Because he always uses that, and I have no idea what, he's, what, what, what skin tone that is. And for that matter, mud can be at many, many different types of, of color. So they're not good as descriptive terms. Yeah. Oiled teak, I just Googled it, and it's kind of just like a hardwood floor. A yeah. shiny hardwood floor. Yeah, I would, I would imagine, like, I mean, uh, there's often the appearance of what you call, like, blackwood in fantasy stories. So I imagine just, imagine, like, a dark tree, I think is, like, the, what he's going for is that description. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I would, I do think he should maybe get a person of color to read, because when he calls, when he, comp when he says the skin was as black as pitch, well, that's, that's tar. Yeah. And you have the whole tar baby thing, which is horribly, horribly racist, which I know he's not. That's not what he's doing. He's just comparing it to Wait. the color. Hmm? What's a tar baby? Like yeah, it's, it's another American <laughs> thing. Yeah. Can you educate insult, us like, Australians? Because I am also. Ignorant yeah. Like of this. there are so many different ways to insult babies because they're just like wrinkly, tiny old men that are they do is like cry and shit and eat and just a parasitic. But that's all babies. Like, how can you differentiate between the horribleness of babies? That's my opinion. Sorry if you have children. Well, there is the. I just googled it because um I I to be honest I don't know the full history of the term. I do know it deals with the the color of your skin as compared to tar. But it's also a the di the dictionary definition is a difficult problem that is only aggravated by attempts to solve it. And I do think there was a politician that used the term tar baby recently and he got in trouble for that. Yeah, I guess I would, I, um, I mean, I don't know the specifics behind it, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just, you know, it's related to what we were talking about, um, earlier where basically just trying to, um, to keep segregation alive, um, after the, the civil war and that, you know, was still, 
um, or I don't know, illegal, but it was really, it was at least enforced like it was illegal for um, black and white people to have relationships. It's also um, a story related to Uncle Remus and the Br'er Rabbit uh, character. It's a very long Wikipedia article that um, I'm not going to summarize here, but I, the, the gist of it is it is a racist term. Um, and it kind of, to talk about some, some things that go on in the black community, there's an issue of colorism and how some people prefer people who are of a more fair complexion. And so as an insult, it was, you sometimes you get the insult, like people want to mention or insult you for that, for the fact that your skin is darker than theirs and dark skin is kind of considered to be ugly. So it's, it's, um, I know he means well, <laughs> he can, he's not writing to be racist, but when you compare skin color to tar, it's, um, really awkward as is this whole conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah. To, I guess, go back to casting on the show. Let's talk. Well, the prequel series, um, is getting flack because, uh, as the internet trolls love to say, they're focusing more on diversity rather than focusing on telling a, a good story because there are the casts, uh, casting agents are looking for a more diverse set of people. Um, we have so far two black actresses, no, a, a black actress and a black actor. And people are wondering how are they going to factor into the story because this is ye old fake medieval Europe and there should be no black people. Have you guys heard about this? I have not. Um, right, I've it heard sounds that. ridiculous. Um, again, this is this is like undefined history. Even the world book doesn't specify what exactly was going on. All, <laughs> there's all sorts of ways you could write this in if you're so concerned about. Oh, it's it's not historically accurate. Yeah. I, I, I feel like once you. Once also, be on, it's on uh, not historically accurate because you just need to look at Spain. Uh, so I guess it's like the early modern period. So technically not Middle Ages. I also but... mean that as like a joke because this isn't historical. Oh. It's fantasy. Yeah, I know. But it's just like it's not even <laughs> true. Like you can't even use historical arguments for it. Like in Spain, you had because of like Granada being, yeah, the Moors essentially or how they referred to them. Like so you had lots of people of color in Spain, but recently there was a book published and I've forgotten the historian's name, um, but it's about uh, black tutors and that's the title of the book, Black Tutors. So that once again, early modern period, but looking at like, well, even in the medieval times, you had complex trade uh, routes that meant that within a court, you would have maybe one or two people of color at least um, and definitely people of color visiting. Um, so people are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, in just thinking that Europe is super white, predominantly white, but you know, it, trade is complex and interesting. Ugh, people are idiots. <sighs> but yeah, the and, idea of focusing on diversity at the expense of story quality is, I think it's just inherently, it's, it's not, not it's a, fal a false equivalence. Yeah. It's a flawed concept. It's a piss poor excuse to try to stop the conversation. Like to tr we're trying to like have progress. We're trying to make things a better, you know, by talking about things that make us uncomfortable, by trying to rectify some of the situations that um some of the mistakes that have been made over time. There was a period where black people weren't allowed in movies. And if they were allowed in movies, they couldn't even go to the premiere. They had to go through different entrances and exits as opposed to their uh, white counterparts. So like now we're trying to fix those mistakes by saying, hey, you know what? Let's look at other types of people to include in these stories. But you have these racist trolls and even people who just want to play the uh, a centrist role of saying I I'm not either for it or against it. I just feel like we should look to uh, I, I want to see things from both sides. I just, I, it's so frustrating that these people are entering the conversation when they don't really know the history. Yeah, I'm rambling, but it's it's just so annoying. <laughs> right, yeah, no, it's just the 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 internet problem of of people who don't care about the actual argument they're making. They're just trying to stir up shit. 
I just want to, like, I, I know it's not articulate or it's not the best argument. I just want to say, shut the fuck up. Like, let this happen. Yeah, yeah, it's, I know. It's, it's awesome. And, like, it's, like Donna said, it's it's true to history. We, it's the fantasy world, like, the, the real world, excuse me, is not so stratified as fantasy novels are. There's not a place for elves, a place for dwarves, a place for humans. This all, we were always mixing and mingling. You would find, and even in the story, Jalabarzo is in, King Robert's court. So there are black people. There are trade. It does happen. Something uh, something I wanted to um, related to both the show and the books. Um, talking about Noth, the island of Noth. Um, oh, yes. want, basically, do you, do you in your mind do these count as black people? Because I'll I'll read out the description. We only have a very small description. They have dark skin, flat faces, and golden eyes, and that's about all we ever hear about them. Um, yeah. Because I consider the Summer Isles to be the the equivalent of Africa in this story, I would not say they're black people. I would consider them, they're, well, they're people of color, but I don't, I wouldn't say they're black. They kind of remind me of the, I'm trying to, there are, there's an island where there are um melanated people and they have blonde hair and like blue eyes oh solomon right? islands i went there I think, yeah yeah that, that's what they remind me of but those people would not be considered black okay yeah well i i consider the uh first men the andals and the valerians they're all to, in my mind analogs of white people and like they're from all, all sorts of places but yeah I, I was just interested what you guys thought like you can have more than one one people uh, that, that that represents a different population, right? Yeah, it's just yeah the the golden eyes is such a a weird descriptive um, that I don't know. I don't if know. The Valyrians can have purple eyes, which is right, like an yeah. impossible phenotype. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah I see, I see I your know. I see your point there. Right? Yeah, I was just trying to think. Like I was like I, there was there <laughs> was Elizabeth Taylor would beg to differ. Yeah, there wasn't any real she world. Had blue eyes. They were very blue, and she knew how to apply. Um, eye makeup that was like purple and she would wear the right dresses yeah because i looked her up and i was like her eyes aren't purple those are definitely blue but she she played her strengths you know yeah that's all yeah that's something they talk about with regards to like um to fagon in this story where like yeah he you know he wore different types of clothing and you know had certain dye in his hair to basically you know hide the violet eyes and make them look like they were different uh, color i think we did a good job with summer isles history month um we're gonna wrap it up here uh thank everyone for joining me for this episode i mean it got a little weird at times but it's okay it's everything cool. <laughs> it was bound to happen it, it's it, i mean yeah when you <laughs> <laughs> When you're getting into race, things are going to get a little bit uncomfortable, but we're all good. Um, no one's offended. No one's upset. It's just what has to happen when you have these type of conversations. This is how a civil conversation goes. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next time. All right, fuck it. Yo, yo. Real talk. Down hall. I needed to do this song. Yeah, I'm a nerd big secret but i'm a nerd and i love these books if you watch it on hbo and think you know what's going on i appreciate that the people who waited five years for dance this one's for you check it yo on the real your boy is a hip-hop player but for this joint here i'll play the role of king slayer see toe to toe blow for blow we can play g but word to jamie they don't know what the men like me this industry is in a roughed up state cats front so tough you call them yeah, thanks for doing this, Kevin. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'm always happy this... to podcast about, um, yeah, the Beyond Westeros. This was actually one year in the making. I wanted to do this last year, but I it was like February like 25th, and I was like, I think I'm the only black person on this podcast who can do something. <laughs> it was too late. Am I the only black guy, a black person? I, I think that uh, podcast regu- with any regularity, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that was like, there was one episode. Do you think on... because you get 
get more diversity in the later books. Do you think Game of Thrones is isolating to people of color? Like they read the first one and they're just like, there is, you know, this, this is not what I want to read. Like I do want to see a, like a more diverse world. So they, they bail after like the first book and don't get to read the later ones where that is slightly rectified. Is it isolating to, to read as a color? Cause I, I don't know, everything's written for me. I'm white. Like, um, it's isolating because not a lot of my um, black peers read or well, there was a time where fantasy novels weren't considered something that black people got into. This yeah. is probably something we should have mentioned during the episode. I might yeah. tack this on to the end. But like fantasy is kind of like a a white people thing, like what comic books and things of that nature. But that's sort of that's changing now. Like fandoms are being more diverse just simply because people are realizing like they like fantasy books. Um so there was a time when I was read like I was watching the show and I was like, I want to read the books and I want to get my friends into it. But they were like, no, we don't want to read about dragons and swords. Thank you. Uh, and that's kind of why I'm here, because I had nobody to turn to to talk about the show. Oh, like one of the YouTubers that I like listening to during the show is what is it? Teflon TV, like the Teflon Don, just because. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like he's hilarious. And I think, yeah, I think so he goes to the right. con. Yeah, and um, but I think besides him and you, I don't know of any, uh, at least African Americans that are uh, really hyper involved in it. Like just off the top of my head, or who have like. Yeah, yeah there's another guy on YouTube that I found Ideas out recently. Like yeah, yeah, that that's him. I, I actually had thought about like reaching out to him to see if he would want to be on this episode, but I was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> we're, that we're not like professional over here. <laughs> no, this will be a giant mess. I have to do a lot of editing because I floundered so much. But no, he uh, Ideas of Ice and Fire is he's my favorite original content YouTuber because he has such great insights into the series. Yeah, no, he does. He does a good job. And yeah, because he was I mean, he was on a recent episode of History of Westeros. That was really good. At least, or, right, or maybe he was just brought up. I forget. Does he do book only um, YouTube things? Because I've seen his stuff, but I've just never clicked on it because I would be worried if it mentions show stuff. He does... don't click on it because it is a like you will lose hours in a good <laughs> way, but you just need to be prepared. Just be just be prepared. Uh, I think he does both, but um, lately I... he he hates the show and he's not quiet about it. So yeah. I think right, yeah. I th yeah, he focuses on the books, but he may he may use um, information from the show in order to better guess at what's going to happen in the books. Like I wish more people watched him than watched because Mike. <laughs> he ha he's actually like digging into the books. Like he really knows what he's talking about. He's not just making shit up for views. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I do watch, I watch just during the, the show, just because, um, he is humorous and has like my similar, similar views to me on how I, I always pick out kind of the illogical inconsistencies like in, in the show, but otherwise I don't pay attention to him as he is a little too far out there. Cause oh, you're right, beloved Tony, I think Morrison, is that her last name? Mm, yes. And I, I, from a few pieces that I've read, like when you see like fantasy or sci-fi written by people of color, it tends to be less high fantasy, but tends to be more character driven stories with fantastical elements. And I, I wonder, yeah, like you said, your friends are like, eh, dragons and shit. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that's why it's gone off in that way because it's, just implicitly isolating high fantasy because of all the baggage that comes with it. I, I don't know. Like, I'm I think most so of it's just based moved. off Lord of the Rings and that's just so, um, well, you know, it is, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. I will say one of my favorite theater going, I think I said this before, but one of my favorite theater going experiences was Return of the King. Cause when Le Legolas got on screen, some black woman was like, that's my man. <laughs> <laughs> so we do, it, it, there's some things that cross that barrier into like what we would 
what black people would usually watch, you know, some, something that's not typically in something that's not typically to watch or read, like some things are just so popular that, and I think uh, Game of Thrones is another show that's yeah, like it's really beyond fantasy. Yeah, it's transcended that. Um, and yeah, and I mean, and yeah, and to be fair, like fantasy ex- itself is not a genre for for everyone, no matter you know <laughs> what what race you are. <laughs> As there definitely there definitely some some tropes that don't um, that many people find ridiculous. Yeah. I kind of wish George went full Habsburg on like the incest, where like certain elements of their physiology was more exaggerated because of the uh, um, incest, but instead they just end up being crazy instead of disfigured. And super beautiful. Like they just get more beautiful the more they incest. (laughs) (sighs) Not the way that it works. Habsburg jaw. I like looking up like modern day royals and trying to see if I can see the Habsburg jaw there. No, like this. that. Some of the that kind of the Habsburg. Oh yeah, they they now have. Uh, I think it's called Windsor ear. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some some of the royals, and I'm not going to name names. Just just royals in general look 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 a bit incesty. Oh yeah. But that's what happens when you have a whole like continent of monarchs that are like most of them are related to Queen Victoria in a way, and that's just not far enough away for me to feel comfortable. You know, the Queen and Prince Philip are are they cousins or second cousins? Second Something cousins, that, I think. Are second cousins. Blah. Still yeah. still still doesn't <laughs> sit right with me. Oh dude, M- Mountbatten tried to set up Charles with like Either his niece or his daughter, and the grandmother like nixed it because yeah, that's essentially like Charles's grandfather trying to set him up with. Yeah. Mm-mm. I think one of our politicians married his first cousin. Is didn't Rudy? Is it really Rudy Giuliani married his first cousin, Matt? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep. I um, mean, yeah, that's that, certainly there's. That's the least of his examples problems. of that, and. In America, within the you know even within the past hundred years, um, but yeah, gotta be honest, don't don't know. FDR and Eleanor were like fifth cousins. I think that's okay. Fifth cousins, you have many many degrees of separation. Yeah. Yeah. I the creepy Brad thing Pitt about that Angela. is like FDR, like hero worshipped. Uh, Brad Roosevelt Pitt and Angelina so much. Jolie, they're seventh cousins, I believe. Really? They went back far <laughs> enough. Huh, I had no idea. Yeah, in the, um, oh, it's called Who Do You Think You Are over here. Um, what is it? It's run by a, a different guy. It's on PBS. Um, is it uh, Into Your Roots or something? Um, oh, the one George Wendell. Genial- like, yeah, the, yeah, like he was recently on it. Um, but Cara Sedgwick and Kevin Bacon are kind of related, and they had no idea until they were on that. So it's kind of like playing Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, but <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, like the Russian roulette version. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ben like Affleck went on and then found out like his family was slave owners and was like, yeah, you're not felt like showing this episode mm. ever. Yeah. That's quite unfortunate. <laughs> I just feel like when I hear the term, anytime you say cut, like you and this person are cousins, like I'm like, I'm out. I'm done. I don't care. Like, yeah, it's an instant is. turn off. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, like the view of it or the optics of it is more discouraging, you know, than, than the actual science. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's because there's only like one word to describe, like, and that's why you get degrees of cousin. You hear as cousin, you don't hear the degrees part because it's actually really hard to to visualize. There's a a tree for it for like genetic um, counseling and that kind of thing of like how far cousins are out and that kind of thing. But all you hear is cousins. Like you're like, oh no, you grew up together, you have the same grand grandparents. Or it's like, oh no, they could have the same like great 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 grandparents. But oh. 
You're saying we're family, so no, I'm not mm. with you. Yeah. All right. All right, folks. Yeah, I need so, to um, head I don't out wanna, here. I don't want to do another six-hour episode because <laughs> I'm still tired from this. Yeah. Week. All right. Um. Again, thank you guys for showing up and discussing Black or Summer Isles History Month, and I will see you all for the next one. See you guys. Hopefully see before you. Black Panther two. Yes. <laughs> All right, see you guys. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye.